so it, it's a bit of a tricky one when people have applied and it depends kind of how soon um, it'll kind of be in place. Um, so usually it's a case by case um, situation. Do you want to clarify, Sean? I, I noticed you said you're happy to read. Oh, there we are. Hey guys, thanks for taking up. Um, my question is, so I've been a permanent resident for one year and I was eligible to apply for citizenship this March, so I applied for it. So there are cases where you have uh, seen them, people getting citizenship within three months, but the government says the time is um, 21 months. So I'm wondering if I'm eligible for it. Yeah, so I think with those timeframes, um, it'd probably um, not possibly be the right time. Um, the reason for that, Sean, is that for us to be able to get you a defence security clearance before you start in February, um, which can take up to six months, we'd need to kick that off, um, you know, quite soon. Um, so we just um, possibly wouldn't be able to work with those timeframes at the moment. So dual nationality is, is not, it's generally not an issue. And the reason why uh, we do ask for nationality, if, if you've already gone online to apply or you've had a look at our application process, you will see that we do ask if you're a dual national and if so, um, of what other country and we do ask where you were born. We're not just being nosy. So one, here's a little bit, a little project for you. International Traffic in Arms Regulations or ITAR is, uh, is essentially t a sort of security clearance. So security clearance is one thing, and then ITAR is something else. ITAR is essentially an American export control. And a number of the programs that we're involved with have, um, you know, have American um, involvement, whether that be suppliers or uh, components, or, or it could be that we're working with America on that project. So in some cases where you were born or your other nationality might preclude you from being involved in work that has an ITAR requirement. Not all of our projects have an ITAR requirement though. We have people who work with us who have very great careers and move around the business, but cannot work on an ITAR project. That's fine. We, we don't discriminate you against you if that's the case, but we do need to make sure that we don't put you in a position where you're not technically allowed to work, massive fines for the organisation if that happens. So that's why we ask the question. It does seem a little intrusive, but it's just to ensure that we are putting people in the right role. So that's our international traffic and arms regulations if you want to look that up. In terms of the expected timelines, um, would be uh, looking at having everything wrapped up hopefully by the end of June. Um, so there's obviously a, a number of steps that we need to work through between now and then in terms of, um, you know, meeting um, candidates virtually online um, and then also um, our background checks and screening that we do as part of the process as well um, and, and finalising offers and that sort of thing. So um, we are hoping to move uh, fairly quickly through the process, um, but there's, you know, quite a few moving parts that, that we need to work with. Um, in terms of what we look for in our graduates. So um, when we're looking for graduates, it's really important to us that they're well-rounded. So technical skill set is important, but also just as important for us is um, behavioural fit within our team. So um, what I mean by that is we're looking for the right balance of technical skills and also um, behaviours as well. So important for us is things like um, being able to communicate well, being able to work in teams and um, you know really collaborate um, and, you know, provide solutions to problems in teams. Um, so they're some of the key things that we look at. So at a graduate level, we understand that, you know, many graduates might not have had the, um, the opportunity to experience life in, um, you know, a professional role in their field. Um, so it's not, um, you know, something that you have to have. Um, but it does, it does work in your favour because we can see that you've had the opportunity to um, experience some of those tasks and activities um, and also work amongst teams um, and with customers and that sort of thing. So um, in terms of our expectations, we don't expect people to um, have an awful lot of experience, um, but any experience that you do have is beneficial. Um, but again, we're looking for well-rounded people. So um, you might not have that technical experience, but you might have some really good, um, you know, volunteer work, or you might be a member of a society group um, or something like that. So they're all really, really good things to include um, in your resume for us to look at as well. 
Um, one more question. Do mm -hmm. uh, university projects count or is it just out of university projects? No, they count too. So um, definitely you, you're free to talk about those in, um, in interviews or, um, you know, if you want to mention that in your cover letter and say, you know, this is what I've learned from it. Um, definitely go ahead with that. It can be a daunting experience if it's not something that you're very familiar with. Um, you know, a lot of us are used to speaking to people face, face to face um, and it can be, um, you know, a bit challenging when you're not receiving any feedback or, you know, any of that sort of thing. Um, I think the advice I would give is, um, you know, if there's any possible way for you to do some practice. So um, I, I believe there is some free um, trials that you can do online. Um, so you can just practice and get um, get a bit of a feel for the technology and how, how to use it. Um, the other thing as well with the provider that we use, we actually give you unlimited opportunities to film and to think about your response to the question. So um, again, that gives you an opportunity to, you know, sit down, have a, have a really good think about how you're going to respond, um, record your question, see it, see it played back. Um, if you're not happy, you can do it again. Um, and you can do that as many times as you like. Okay, so I was going to mention that, yeah, because that's, um, I remember doing that when I applied and it was, BAE Systems is the only place I applied to that did that, that let you re-record your responses, which is great. Like it makes the whole thing way, way less stressful. So that was, yeah, yeah. it's good that that still exists. I was going to ask if it, if it still happened, but that's good. So your cover letter is a really an opportunity for you to sell yourself um, to us. So um, I think no more than a page, absolutely. Um, keep it, keep it brief. Um, why do you want to work for us? Um, why should we employ you? What sort of things can you bring to the team? Um, really use it as an opportunity for you to sell yourself to us. Any other interview and application tips at all? Kathleen Brandon, before we clock off? Follow the, follow the requests. Um, we um, ask for a resume and academic transcript. And that could be ideally official, but if you have an unofficial, that's okay too. And we say a cover letter is optional, but use the tips that Brenna shared and definitely include that. You would be surprised at how many applications we get with just a resume and people don't put the academic transcript in. And you can imagine how many hundreds of applications that we get. That chasing, we just don't have time to do it. So if, if you're being asked for transcripts or cover letters or documents or anything else, it, exactly what the person the company is asking for give that to them and as Brenna said uh, don't miss that opportunity to include a cover letter because that your CV will give us the facts and your emotion as to why you are so keen to work with us or work with someone else that's where you can share that that the cover letter is the ideal place yeah. and would you agree Kathy I mean you, you see a lot of different um applications at a lot of different points the ones that really stand out are the ones that can really articulate why they want to work not just in defense or in engineering but specifically for BAE absolutely show us that you know something about what we do uh, information is not hard to find now so talk to us in your cover letter about um, maybe this a project of particular interest or I'm fascinated by the work that BA systems does and, and name a few specifics and tell us why that appeals to you and what you why that appeals to you for your career for your, to be a graduate and also later in your career and what you can bring to the table mm -hmm.